This young man is Abhimanyu Mishra. He's 14 years and 10 months old and he's currently leading the US Championship after three rounds. That's ahead of Levon Aronian, Wesley So, Fabiano Caruana, esteemed super GMs. Now this guy is possibly the next Magnus Carlsen. And I know what you're saying, yeah, 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 you're just doing it for clicks, what you want about, but hear me out. So he's the youngest ever grandmaster and he at 14 years and 10 months of age has a higher rating than what Magnus Carlsen did at that same age also higher than Hikaru Nakamura at that age Fabiano Caruana world number one sorry world champion right now Ding Luren even the modern generation Gukesh Ali Reza Firuzja they were lower rated at this same age the only player I could find was Pragnananda. He had a very similar rating to uh, Mishra, about 10 points higher. But this guy is serious, and you're going to see it in this game, which is just exceptional. Even for a seasoned player, it's special, but for a guy of his age. Let's check this one out. It's round three, and his opponent is Ray Robson, who's 28 years old now. I think of him as a young guy, but, you know, he's getting older. 2,700 roughly player. No slouch. Let's check this one out. We get D4, D5 on the board. C4 and C6, the Slav defence. And I love to see where this goes now, because after knight f3, knight f6, the second knight developing, we get e6, the semi-Slav, an opening close to my own heart, because since Vichy Anan played this back in the day, I've been playing this for the best part of a decade. Check out the Vichy game against Levon Aronian, 2013 Tartar Steel, immortal game if you've never seen this opening in action for black. So we get g3. Now this is a sideline move really. The main one is bishop g5. You can get the razor sharp Botvinnik variation or you get e3. Now when you go like this, you're allowing black to take on c4. Win a clean pawn because the bishop is going clear in the other direction. You're not recapturing that anytime soon. Why would you do this as white? Well, here's the idea. After castles, b5, black supporting that pawn, now white goes e4. You take those key central squares and you want to attack black, blow them off the board for snapping off that pawn. So bishop b7, very natural. Now e5, Robson not hanging about. You kick that knight, which is a defender of the king, and you also vacate the e4 square for a knight. Look out for landing on d6 one day if possible and you open the scope of this bishop. And now knight g5, here comes the attack immediately. h6, provocative move, but look at the timestamps. Both players just blitz into this point. They're in their theory. And guess what this invites? Well, already on move 10, we get a brilliancy. This is what you saw in the thumbnail. Robson sacks the piece, takes on e6 and lands a check. King e7. Now there's a saying in the English chess circuit, if you can grab two pawns and a check for the minor piece, you're doing all right. Chuck on a bit of time trouble, you know, you're in for a winner. Now here, Robson, he's just got one pawn. So what's he playing at? How can this be enough compensation? Well, he's going for a king hunt. Now he starts with the right move. The wrong move is bishop g5 check. Looks so natural. Now you pick up the rook, but the problem is knight b6, queen hops back, and the king starts running away. This one's covering. The attack is fizzling. It's not so precise. So knight e4 played. Best move. Why is this so good? Well, if you're ever analysing chess by yourself and you want to figure out a threat, then ask yourself, what if, you know, your opponent did something innocuous? Random move. Well, now knight d6 is the problem in this position. You're threatening this mate. There's no queen e8 to cover, so you have to slide the queen this way. White's invading, the base is dropping. It's awful. So that's why queen e8 blitzed out Mishra on more time than he started with. Now we get bishop g5 check. So we get the whole same variation. Why is it now okay for white? Well, here's the difference. We get king d8 played, but now if you go knight b6 to run like this, 
there's knight d6 and you pick up this critical tempo the queen's got to cover now you drop back you're threatening the invasion the pawn subtle differences i love chess when it's all about these tempos it's a dance of the pieces right you have to get the timing right so king d8 played best move the pawn drops on g5 Queen e7 pressures the knight. This queen drops back and defends, and king c7. Mishra castling by hand, and by clearing this back rank, now when queen g6 comes, pressuring e6, the base of the chain, well, black is just in time to defend with rook to e8. And something has literally just occurred to me. What if white attacks that pawn again for a second time? Okay, apparently king b8 is good. And if you capture the pawn, okay, c5, and black's getting counterplay apparently. Maybe something to do with leaving this diagonal is not good because now this one's unopposed. These positions are absolutely wild. It's so hard to evaluate even when you've got an engine. But what we see from Ray here is pawn a4. Both players blitzing, very natural. He's trying to rip open lines on the queen side. So the king steps back to b8 completes the manual castling and now look at this for a move this is where you have to have done your homework so robson plays rook to a3 he's lifting that one into the game and look at the journey it's going on into f7 you know it's like this snake about to snake across the board does anyone remember playing that on your old nokia 3310 trying to eat some apples and this rook is heading for the mother load the Granny Smith gonna kick it out of that square and then e6 drops. So black reacts at the right moment. You get knight c7, covering the base of the chain. Rook f3 played, preparing to invade, and now this move is so classy. Probably prep because it was played so quick. But how many of us are playing this horrible looking move of pawn takes on a4 and it is the best move it looks so ugly you split all the pawns black now has six isolated pawns right awful islands weak you're opening lines to the king but it's not so easy to exploit you know if you swing one of these rooks back or something well there is always knight b6 covering and long term these could be dangerous in the end game deep stuff from mishra so h4 now played from Robson. He just holds off a moment with this. This could get very dangerous if ever the g-pawn drops. We see queen d8. Look at that. All the pieces on the back rank. But beware, because if black ever uncoils, then you've got two minor pieces for the rook. You've got dangerous pawns. White has to show something here. So we get rook f7 invading. Rook e7 trying to trade pieces. The rook drops back. But something subtle has happened here. The rook now blocks the bishop from defending d6. What's the uh, importance of that? Well, after queen e8, Robson naturally tries to keep pieces on the board and Mishra now goes wrong. Uh, knight d5, apparently his best move. He goes g6, opening this rook, but there's a problem. That pawn actually becomes weak and now the queen is the third piece eyeing this f7 square along with rook and knight so white can actually invade but ray does it in the wrong way he should go knight to f7 looks a bit weird to self pin but the queen is about to take here and long story short this is stronger because you don't trade the rooks and while the rook sits here it blocks the bishop and while the bishop is blocked then once the queen takes and gets protected and everything, you can soon be hopping with knight d6. It's not ideal for black. But Ray misses it and goes rook f7. Natural plan, but now great play by Mishra, c5. The unraveling process begins. Now why is white not taking this one? Well then this pawn is dropping here. I mean you can take on g2 first, but long story short, then the knight's taking on e5, you hit the rook everything springs to life for black so instead we see bishop takes king recaptures the queen takes on g6 but now some liquidation knight takes and this is the problem here mishra takes in the center and look at the power of these pawns the squares that have now been cleared for these knights to start hopping into we get check we get knight d5 
Now you can't immediately take the pawn. The knight's hanging. Again, Ray just goes wrong. You know, I suspect Hikaru or Magnus, they would recognize you have to go knight g5. You have to keep some tricks alive, pieces on the board, maybe help support this pawn or something. The problem with knight d6 check played in the game is now Mishra can snap it off Pawn recaptures, yes you're pressuring here, but you've got rid of one of white's attacking pieces and this end game's now tough because queen h8 is an excellent move. If white takes this pawn, you know this one's no longer on prees, it's defended. Well now these knights can defend each other. You also defend the pawns, the queen's here, d3 is coming. You know black's just doing well, the king's safe as houses with these knights defending. So what we see instead is rook d3, begging black to push on with d3, then blunder the c4 pawn, not what you want. But Mishra, he's too classy, he slams down knight e5, fantastic move. If you take with the queen, you're running into check, queen drops. If you take with the rook, same tactic, this time you distract the queen and the rook drops here. Beautiful chess, so the pawn pushes, Bit of a randomizer from Ray. Look at his time, three minutes 30. They're on to move 34. They've still got about six moves to make. Now you can go king c7 and cover the pawn like that, but it's understandable. Mishra doesn't want to bring this piece over, you know, towards the danger zone, the heavy pieces. So he snaps off with this knight. This pawn does drop, but he's seen deeper because after captures, rook captures, a3 on the board. Look at the beauty of that pawn capturing on a4 earlier. Mishra saw deep into the end game because now after you capture, there was nothing better. The c pawn plows on, the rook has to try and cover, but here come the noble steeds flying into the position and you cannot stop this pawn. So Ray goes for this counterplay. Knight d3, the knight immune, the pawn is pushing. Look how this knight controls c3. The pawn controls d1, it's unstoppable. So instead, we see h6, c2, the rook goes, and now classy stuff. Knight f6, not rushing this, covering here. We get g4, trying to distract that knight, but knight h7. Uh, h7. Knights are amazing blockaders of pawns, as we can see. King g2, the queen is made, the baby girl's chopped off, knight recaptures, f4, raise down to his last ditch, but Mishra marching the king. Activate your king in endgames. Classic case of this is the right time to do it, because after g5, knight f8, blockading those pawns some more, king g4, knight d3, f5, well after check and king f4, we soon see this one just shouldering the white king out. We get this check here, Brilliant finish from Mishra, knowing when to give back the material. The knight just blockades those pawns. The king comes older, uh, over, shouldering that white one out. A4, A5, pawn H7, king E5 played, and now you have to give ground. King F5, and after king H6, E5, we see resignation and not prematurely. What do you do as white? You're about to drop a pawn. If you march in to promote this one, no worries, we push this, you make a queen, we take, this drops, that one's going through. That is a seriously classy game from Mishra. Great prep, great execution, takes down a 2700. This guy is serious and he's not even 15 yet. Think of the things he can't do, but he can play chess, that's for sure. I hope you enjoy. Do smash that like button if you did. Really helps me out. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to see another epic game of chess, check out the video on the screen. And I hope to see you again soon.